two minutes a day of vigorous physical activity every day is associated with markedly lower risk of all-cause mortality, risk of developing type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Three 20-second bursts of very hard exercise. So that could be on a bike. You could imagine ascending four or five flights of a stairwell at a vigorous pace. Even 20 seconds of effort repeated a couple of times. If people do that a few times a week for a couple of weeks, we can see meaningful improvements in their fitness. You have helped to popularize high-intensity interval training known as HIT training as a time-efficient workout. Could you explain exactly what HIT is and why it's so effective compared to traditional uh, workouts. Yeah, so interval training is just alternating periods of more intense work separated by periods of recovery. You know, high-level athletes have practiced it for more than a century. The key is what counts as high intensity. And I, I think that it generally aligns with vigorous intensity effort, which is well-defined in the public health guidelines. So for example, on a 10-point scale, where zero is laying on the couch, 10 is sprinting from danger, saving your child from an oncoming car. It is a seven or eight on that scale. It's roughly 80% of your maximal heart rate, or you could say a few words, but would not want to engage in a conversation. So you could eke out a few words, need to catch your breath. That's sort of the intensity that we're talking about that puts people in the vigorous range and would count as high intensity interval training. And many people who are familiar with this term here, high intensity interval training, uh, they will think it's automatically just suited to fitness enthusiasts and to gym bunnies. But uh, what are some of the broader cohorts of society and demographics uh, that would be particularly suited to this form of training? Almost anyone. And so HIT has now been widely applied to individuals uh, with metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, older individuals, uh, people involved in coronary heart disease rehabilitation, so cardiac rehabilitation programs. It has been widely applied. And so the key is what is vigorous for you or for the specific individual? And so for a high level Olympic athlete, HIT is sprinting on a treadmill at a very steep incline. Whereas for a cardiac patient, it's basically risk walking, maybe with a very slight incline or on the flat. So the key is individualizing exercise intensity uh, based on starting fitness level. Your research suggests that you don't need hours in the gym in order to reap health benefits. What is the minimum effective dose of exercise that can significantly impact health as far as you're concerned? And, and again, this will vary obviously from person to person. It will. And there's this intensity duration trade-off. So are you on that lower level of vigorous exercise, just getting into it? Or are you talking all out sprinting, for example? But assuming we're getting to that vigorous zone, there's compelling work now to suggest that even in a few minutes a day, so where the name of my book, The One Minute Workout, comes from, it's from research that was looking at three 20-second bursts of very hard exercise. So that could be on a bike. You could imagine ascending four or five flights of a stairwell at a vigorous pace. Even 20 seconds of effort repeated a couple of times. If people do that a few times a week for a couple of weeks, we can see meaningful improvements in their fitness. So their VO2 max or their cardiorespiratory fitness goes up. We see favorable changes in blood markers of health. And that laboratory research is dovetailing with emerging epidemiological research. So these studies that look at associations showing that even a few minutes a day of vigorous, sporadic physical activity. So you can imagine, again, taking the stairs, hustling for the bus, getting off uh, at, a, at a flight and carrying a heavy backpack up a few flights of stairs. Two minutes a day of vigorous physical activity every day is associated with markedly lower risk of all-cause mortality, risk of developing type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Because the body wants to be stimulated, it wants to be given the opportunity to adapt. Isn't that the case? I, I spoke with a neurologist recently who said that uh, we needed to constantly stimulate the brain because the brain wanted to experience novel conditions 
new experiences. Uh, similarly, I spoke with uh, an expert in uh, muscles and protein consumption last week, and he was saying the same thing. The, the body, the muscles need constant stimulation in order to facilitate adaptation. Yeah, absolutely. The body is going to respond to the stress placed on it. I'm reminded of uh, Daniel Lieberman, the Harvard evolutionary biologist, his book called Exercise, you know, why something that we never evolved to do is so healthy. And obviously making the point that we've done such a good job of engineering physical activity out of our lives that now we sort of have to find these opportunities to stimulate the body uh, and engage in, in some vigorous intensity effort uh, periodically. But you're right, it's going to respond to the load placed on it. Uh, and so... Uh, we're trying to meet people where they are. The physical activity guidelines are obviously based on excellent science, but a lot of people are saying they either don't have time for it or they don't value the time to engage in that amount of activity. And so our work is is you know part of uh, a, a broad range of initiatives, I think, that are saying, okay, how, how little can we get away with? You know, what's sort of the minimum effective dose uh, in order to see some health benefits to at least maintain uh, fitness and functional capacity as we age? And where did the term that you coined exercise snacks come from and how useful has that been in getting your message across? Yeah, we like the term, so we're not the first to coin it, but uh, we, we've tried to give it some, you know, laboratory definitions. Uh, I, I think the first use of it was by some Harvard professors in a, in a, a news magazine. But uh, we like the idea because it gets across, you know, people think of a snack. OK, that's a you know, a, a small amount, you know, it's a little dose of food or something like that. So an exercise snack, it conveys this concept, uh, a, a brief type of, of activity. And so for us, an exercise snack is vigorous physical activity or vigorous exercise, and the dose lasts less than a minute. And we're starting to look at if people do those snacks three, four, five times a day. So that's only five minutes of vigorous exercise spread throughout the day does that have meaningful effects? Again, red, boosting your fitness, changing some blood sugar metrics, uh, changing some blood pressure, or blood fat metrics. People will have heard the term runner's high in the past. They'll be familiar with that, uh, that feeling of endorphins coursing through the system whenever they do even a short burst of exercise. Uh, there's an increasing focus uh, and a link between exercise and mental health now. How does this uh, high intensity interval training or HIIT training impact mood or stress levels? And also what con contribution does it make towards mental clarity? Yeah, so I'd say generally speaking, we know less about that, but there's clearly evidence to suggest, for example, that uh, BDNF, which I'm sure people have heard about this idea of uh, you know, that's sort of the fertilizer for your brain stimulates neurogenesis. Uh, part of the increase in BDNF uh, in relation to exercise is based on intensity. So it's clearly related to dose, but also intensity. So the suggestion would be that when we engage in these vigorous activity bouts, even though they might be quite short, you might get these pulsatile increases in BDNF that may then feed forward to, again, fertilizing the brain a little bit. But uh, again, these these conclusive mechanistic links, at least in humans, I, I think really need to be established. But absolutely, short bouts of physical activity uh, can boost mood, can boost energy level. Uh, there's even evidence to show that it can enhance learning in, in, in young people on test taking. Post-exercise, is there any distinction between uh, doing a HIIT uh, workout and a, a long endurance session as far as endorphin levels are concerned and not to post-exercise high? Yeah, not so much, I don't think, on the endorphin level. And this is where I think it's also very individualized, right? And so, you know, we're, we're not here to say that uh, vigorous exercise or HIIT is, is a panacea. It's going to work for everyone. But we also know that especially for folks who cite time as a main barrier, they're more than willing to trade off longer duration exercise for these shorter bouts or periods of time when you're quite busy and you might be inclined to blow off your workout. It's just a reminder that, no, no, even if you got five minutes in the day, you can engage in that and, and, it, and it's going to be beneficial, but clearly very individualized responses, just like anything we look at in exercise where it's that change in fitness level or blood pressure or blood sugar, there's of course always a range. And so the best advice, I think, is to mix it up and engage in different types of activities and durations. Uh, but clearly, hit can kick can play a role. Uh, you know, when you're time pressed, in particular. 
you preempted my next question. I was going to ask you that specifically about in- integrating a hit into a-, a broader spectrum of exercise regimens. So you could do your long run or long swim or long cycle, and you could also engage in hit exercises throughout the week. Absolutely right. I think the minimum is you know three times. If you have even three twenty minute blocks a week, you know do a session of continuous exercise at a relatively moderate pace. Uh, engage in some resistance exercise and do some more vigorous stuff. Do some hit. Uh, you know that's not getting you to the guidelines, but at least it's going to start uh, a- along the way there. But yeah, to your point, I think varying it up is always best. It's a bit like the investing analogy. You know, you might win with a single stock, but most of us are better off spreading the risk because we don't know which of those is going to respond best for us. Hit is often marketed as a quick solution for weight loss. How effective is a high intensity interval training for weight management? I ask because I spoke with a doctor a few months ago who was very much a proponent of uh, sprinting. He said it would be it's a it's a great way to uh, attack uh, that visceral fat and get rid of uh, abdominal fat. Would you go along with this? There's some evidence for that. I think there's you see a lot of st- uh, overstatement when it comes to high intensity interval training and weight loss. You know, you look on the internet and people who talk about this afterburn effect or the stimulation of calorie burning and recovery. Uh, it's definitely real, uh, but it but it's but it's small. And so I think much like these other responses we're talking about, it can maybe get you there faster. So with a shorter bout of intense exercise, you can result in the same calorie burn as a longer period of moderate exercise. But, you know, exercise remains the minor player in weight management, can still play a role, can still be very important. But of course, diet and nutrition is is the key one there. But to the physician's point, there's definitely some work showing that uh, you can see some visceral fat uh, changes, some animal studies, even looking at liver fat with more high intensity exercise, you know, suggesting that might be targeted, if you will, or or we might see some changes there. How does HIT compare with endurance sessions when it comes to improving cardiovascular health and muscle growth? So on the cardiovascular side of things, uh, you know, there, there's two ways to think of it. Uh, there's what I call the apples to apples comparison. So we're going to compare a given dose of traditional endurance with a similar dose of HIT. So the overall energy expenditure there is the same, but you can think equal amount of moderate versus equal amount of HIT. I think there there's compelling data that HIT is the clear winner. So the you're going to see a greater improvement in your cardiorespiratory fitness, no matter who you are whether you're an athlete, whether you're someone in a cardiac rehab program with a HIT uh, approach. Now, many people are interested in the apples to oranges comparison. How does a small dose of vigorous compare to a larger dose of the traditional moderate? And I think there you can see similar changes in fitness, despite the fact that you're doing less total exercise, less total time commitment with the HIIT workouts. I think where you start to see the overstatement is when people suggest, oh, just a small amount of HIIT, you're going to get these markedly greater benefits than a larger dose of endurance. I I don't think the evidence is certainly as as compelling for that. HIIT is, by its uh, name, intense. Uh, Recovery is obviously a, a big part of this too. What recommendations would you have uh, when it comes to recovery strategies, it, especially to prevent overtraining or, or injury in people who engage in hit, yeah. So I think here it really depends on what type of hit you're doing. So you know, sprinting on a treadmill, sprinting uphill outside, that's very different from riding vigorously on a stationary bike, swimming, or performing on an elliptical. So I, I, I think there, if you're doing um, exercise not on equipment. Uh, you know, there's the potential for greater uh, joint impact forces, injuries, uh, straining muscles, things like that. So it really depends on the type of exercise you're doing. And when it comes to uh, the issue of overreaching, overtraining, uh, my personal view is it's related to both volume and intensity. So volume plays a very big role there. And so just hit per se, I don't think is going to set you up for, for overtraining. Uh, but you really need to be mindful of the total volume of work that you're doing as well. So don't mean to be that scientist that hedges on every response, but like a lot of things, there's you know there's nuance here to uh, to to the questions and and the uh, and the issues. 
And is there a link between high-intensity interval training and uh, the immune system? Because we know that when we overextend ourselves, our immune system can take a hammering. So should people be cautious then in that case if they don't want to become run down as a result of engaging in HIIT, hit training? Yeah, and I, I, again, I, I think it comes back to this idea of overtraining and, and certainly one of the hypotheses related to why people get overtrained is links to, to the immune system. Again, there, I think, number one, highly individualized, but number two, probably if you're getting into HIIT or you want to start upping the intensity, you know, start slow and build from there. So definitely if you're not used to a HIIT workout, no one is suggesting that you should go out and sprint as hard as you can, you know, build intensity and get out of your comfort zone. We'll often tell people, you know, where you are right now. Okay. You're going to engage in some HIIT, get out of your comfort zone, maybe try it once a week, see how you go from there, see how your recovery progresses and then build. So it's a lot of common sense, I think, training principles. And we know with any type of exercise, if people do too much too soon, uh, that's when they'll often get burned out, whether that's directly related to the immune system injury or just, it's just too, you know, mentally taxing. Because as you know, oh, you know there's no free lunch here, right? Vigorous exercise is challenging. Uh, and so it's not something that most people certainly want to do every day. Uh, what are your thoughts on nutrition for this form of training? You know, I, I, I'm going to come back to following typical dietary recommendations is generally going to be adequate. You know, as long as you're consuming uh, sufficient total energy, I think if you're going to engage in HIIT, uh, you, you need a, a base amount, certainly of carbohydrates. So, you know, marked carbohydrate restriction with high intensity interval training, I don't think that's necessarily a great combination for, for most individuals. But unless you're a high level endurance exerciser, engaging in, you know, many hours a week of high intensity. I don't think you necessarily have to carbohydrate load or supplement either. So I think for most folks, uh, you know, that a standard diet, and what I mean by that is as, as generally recommended in public health guidelines is going to be adequate for most people in terms of supporting the nutritional needs for high intensity interval exercise. Are there any particularly interesting and unanswered questions in this area or in the area of exercise science that you're you're dying to get the solution to yeah so i i think where the yeah, and you're seeing emerging evidence and you know now we're now we're at the point where there's almost every month there's a new systematic review coming out related to interval training but really what we need are these large-scale randomized controlled trials in large groups of individuals that are looking at things like the relationship to mortality, the relationship to cardiovascular diabetes disease progression. I, I alluded to some of that epidemiological work that's out now, and we need these large-scale randomized controlled trials. There, there's some of them, but it's a bit like you know when there's a new drug on the market that's trying to either knock off or we're saying it's at least as good as the as the the industry standard. That's a bit like where HIT is. You know, there's robust scientific evidence for guideline-based recommendations. And so now I think the question is very interesting. Well, if you do these small doses of interval training, how does that stack up against the traditional guidelines when these studies are of high quality, robust in large numbers of individuals? And so you're starting to see that work, but definitely that's where the field needs to go. I think the whole issue of biological sex-based differences we still need to learn more there and just diversity writ large, right? In, in terms of exercise responses in different groups of, uh, of individuals. Uh, and the last point, I think it would be fascinating to try and figure out and predict individual responsiveness, right? So, you know, we talked earlier in the conversation, we don't really know if we take 100 people, who's going to respond well, who's not going to respond well. If we could start to identify, you know, there's a field called metabolomics, trying to identify chemical signatures in saliva or blood that might predict exercise responsiveness. I think that's a fascinating field and, and one that uh, would could go a long way in, in terms of uh, individualizing exercise prescription. Well, the book is called The One Minute Workout. Dr. Martin Gabala, thank you so much for your thoughts today. Really enjoyed having you on the podcast. Great to join you. If you enjoyed that video, check out this video right here.